Hello, and welcome to the second of three webcasts in the series Mathematics Instructional Strategies, a look at the OGT. Today we will look at assessment items from across the standards that all use proportional reasoning. My name is Peggy Costin, and I'm the Executive Director of the Ohio Resource Center for Mathematics, Science, and Reading. This webcast will not provide any silver bullets or prescriptive how-to methods for being sure your students will be successful on the OGT. There are no silver bullets or simple prescriptions. Ohio's teachers do an amazing job educating diverse student populations to high levels, but even the best of us can improve. Improvement will probably not happen because somebody comes and tells teachers something they did not know. Improvement will happen because teachers interact with their colleagues about student teaching and learning. Today we want to model some discussion, which will be fun for the panel, but the goal is that you and your colleagues have the same kind of dialogue resulting in improved student learning. Today's panelists are Brian Roger, a mathematics consultant for the Ohio Department of Education who taught mathematics in the Dayton City Schools for 13 years before joining the department, Kay Wallace, who taught high school mathematics for 30 years and is now the mathematics supervisor for Pickerington City Schools and is a real trooper, she has laryngitis today. <laughs> And Bob Reynolds, Director of Secondary Programs at Forest Hills City Schools. Prior to assuming that position, Bob was Mathematics Supervisor with Hamilton County ESC for eight years, and he was a classroom teacher for 12 years prior to that. Bob, Kay, and Brian, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we're just going to jump right in to the topic at hand today. Kay, why is proportion such an important topic? Well, what proportion is one of those big ideas that starts out <coughs> in fifth grade and goes on through 12, and it kind of relates to all the math that we have from grade five through 12. Brian, what would you say to that? Proportional reasoning is also, it's one of those key building uh, blocks that cuts across all the standards. We see it in the number standard, uh, starting around fifth, sixth grade, uh, and, and building up through the high school. We see it in measurement and geometry with the proportional reasoning within similar shapes. We see it within algebra. We see it within data analysis and probability. So it's one of those key topics that allows us to connect and, and bring those ideas together. It also is a, a foundational for areas such as chemistry and physics that if students have a good understanding of probability of proportionality and that they can it'll help them understand a lot of that chemistry and physics that they'll have later. Bob if you had to convince somebody that proportionality was an important mathematics topic what would you say to do that convincing? Well I might look at the world around us and all the applications that proportional reasoning has in our daily lives. Everything from art to nature to sampling and election year coming up. It's a, a very big component of, of, of that process. Um, music, um, mm -hmm. maps, recipes, it's just all around us everywhere we look and it's something that you can convince students uh, when do we ever need to know this and why do we need to know this mathematics proportional reasoning is a place where it fits in real nicely. Okay, you guys have convinced me that proportional reasoning is important, but uh, I guess now I want to talk a little about the teaching of proportional reasoning. And so Bob, what do you think are some of the major difficulties uh, that people encounter when they're either teaching or learning proportional reasoning? Well, there are several. Um, <coughs> first of all, some students have difficulty in identifying uh, the corresponding parts and proportion problems, whether that's uh, similar figures trying to match up sides of a rectangle or triangle, um, or whether that's a, a problem involving um, other other aspects of uh, one of the problems we're going to look at is a problem involving a mixture, identifying uh, the um, the parts that correspond to one another. Um, students also have difficulty with the whole part-to-whole relationship and 
uh, what is, uh, uh, is it a part to part ratio or is it a part to total ratio? Uh, for example, a common problem we often see on assessment item uh, tests is an item where there's a, a ratio of boys to girls in a classroom and maybe the ratio is four to five. Uh, and the problem also gives that there are 30 students in the classroom. Um, many students um, miss, um, um, make the mistake of not setting up the proportion correctly because they are, are not aware that there are uh, uh, the numbers represent parts and some numbers represent total. Um, they may, may have uh, trouble with the units in a proportion problem and identifying that maybe something is in inches and something else is in feet. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, uh, a big topic we're going to talk about today is the difference between additive and multiplicative reasoning and how uh, in some proportion uh, problems students make the mistake of, of looking at, at it as an additive um, uh, situation instead of a multiplicative situation. We actually have a problem from uh, one of the achievement tests in Ohio to illustrate that. This particular problem comes from the um, 2005 7th uh, grade Ohio Achievement Test. And this problem involves um, a student who is standing next to a tree. And to set up the problem, uh, the, the prompt is that the lance is five feet tall, his shadow is eight feet long. At the same time of day, a tree shadow is 32 feet long. What is the height of the tree? <clears throat> On this particular problem, uh, there were four choices, and choice A was 20 feet, uh, and 38% of our students in Ohio got this correct. Uh, this particular answer could actually have been solved in a, a pretty simple way, just simply by multiplying the five feet of Lance's height times four to get the height of the tree. Uh, that's the same multiplicative relationship as the shadow of Lance compared to the shadow of the tree. Choice B was 24, uh, 24 feet, and 10% of our students in Ohio uh, were able to get, uh, were, were choose this, chose this answer, which was incorrect. Uh, and what they did in this situation is most likely just multiplied three times eight to get to 24. Choice C is the most interesting, interesting distractor choice uh, in that the answer of 29 feet was chosen by 45% of our students in Ohio. And um, what most likely they did is they looked at the difference between Lance's shadow and Lance's height, uh, eight minus five, got a difference of three, and applied that to the uh, tree shadow and the tree's height and simply subtracted three from the 32. Um, and this shows that they are applying incorrectly an additive method of thinking to this particular problem by subtracting instead of thinking of it as a, a multiplicative idea. Choice D, only 6% of our students chose that uh, answer, which was incorrect, and that uh, most likely was chosen simply because they set up the proportion incorrectly and possibly flipped the ratios when they shouldn't have. Um, I guess looking at this item, I think it's pretty um, uh, almost discouraging that 45% um, of the kids use this additive reasoning. Now, but these were seventh graders. A as a group, do you think that the results would have been much different if this had been a t an item for 10th graders? And th that's directed to all of you or any of you. Right offhand, I would say probably not. I mean, we may see them doing a little bit better, but <coughs> again, it's one of those um, types of mistakes that that students carry on with them um, mm. if they if they start doing this at a younger age there many times unless they have corrective instruction to help them understand what they're doing differently they'll continue doing that uh, same type of, of mistake and, and thought process uh, throughout um, their testing and, and educational careers I would say that seventh graders do have experience with this, so they should uh, perform fairly well on this kind of problem. Peggy, we also see this, this misconception uh, take place with adults in the world around us and something like the, the stock market dropping uh, 100 points these days versus 100 points 10 years ago. The, the, different, the percentage drop is, is um, 
much more pronounced, was one much more pronounced when the total level of the market was much lower. Uh, you see it in a lot of other cases where people are simply looking at the the raw number and not comparing it to the total and the uh, the uh, overall percentage or the proportional uh, change. So it's really a mathematical literacy kind of thing here, right? Yes, yeah, it is. yeah. Um, Kate, as a longtime classroom teacher, uh, how do you approach the teaching of proportion, and and what kind of difficulties or, or hints do you have for us? Well, to go back to the last question that Bob brought up, the addition compared to multipli multiplication, <clears throat> I would make students um, something that was a hands-on activity where they could actually show me that <coughs> adding something to um, a figure, all sides of a figure, would not give you a similar figure as in the uh, diagram we have on the screen. Uh, start with a three, four, five. Students could make these out of straws connected with pipe cleaners or they could use um, any different number of manipulatives to try to create these. You could use geometer sketch pen, but add one to each side of that three, four, five triangle. You do not get a similar triangle and let students experience that and let them try to make it look similar and they won't be able to if they have it cut to those dimensions. L likewise, if you double the sides of the first triangle and make it six, eight, ten, you will see a similar figure. Uh, but overall for proportions, I would say to always think of them as equal ratios. However those ratios are made up, we're trying to get equivalent ratios and not jump to solving for the unknown right away but look at two ratios. Are they equivalent? What would make them equivalent? If you are solving a proportion, what, figure out that ratio without actually cross multiplication or any other kind of device to start out with. And similarly, I would say um, make sure those ratios have the same units. Is there, is there a problem that kind of deals with this unit issue? We do have one from the 2005 OGT, and it looks similar to the, the item that Bob outlined, but it, it really it shows a different mistake that students make. Um, the shadow cast by a one-foot ruler is eight inches long. At the same time, a shadow cast by a pine tree is 24 feet long. What's the height of the pine tree? 51% um, did get this correct, but you would have expected more and 27% chose A, which was three feet. Does not make sense for pine tree, um, but they simply took eight inches times three would make 24. So three times one foot would make the pine tree three. They ignored the fact the first triangle did not have the same uh, units and needed to convert one foot to 12 inches. Does this, uh, does this get into um, not looking carefully at the problem or for, I mean, clearly one foot is longer than eight inches on this problem, and yet so we would expect the tree to be taller than 24 feet, but that didn't work. Is this, does it have anything to do with reasonableness of results or? I think it has a, a lot to do with reasonableness of results of a student who primarily just looks at the numbers in this problem and, and, and doesn't look at the context as well, would we'll, we'll quickly set up that proportion and say, oh, I can, I can go from eight to 24 by, by multiplying by three, so I'm just gonna take the one. But not making any reasonable, is it, would it be, would you expect a three foot tree to make a 24 long, foot long shadow when a one foot object's only making an eight inch shadow? So there's that whole proportional reasoning aspect of you know, thinking through and put it into the context that, uh, that we need to help students develop and, and work with. Yeah, Brian, it sounds to me like you're suggesting that we ought to be teaching students to think in mathematics. <laughs> is, is yes, <laughs> I, we, we, we do. I mean, it's one of those things of that balance between uh, teaching the conceptual and, and, and going right to the al or going to the algorithm many times if you go directly to the algorithm and teach them how just to you to to uh, do the cross product aspect of things they c quickly set up a, a proportion and do some cross multiplying but 
d is it the correct, do they really understand why they're doing it? To the, to, instead of developing the concept and having that, all that understanding of, if I set up the proportion and if I understand the proportion, then I can possibly use the algorithm of cross product to find my solution. And, and Kay made the point earlier that you really shouldn't use cross multiplication until kids have a real solid understanding of the equivalent relationship. Yes. And, and uh, then have them estimate, estimate more. Bob, would do any other comments on that? Just yeah, just to echo that, I think that's so important that kids, you know, just from a practical point of view, from a, a <laughs> test taking strategy of eliminating answers that are unreasonable, but also just uh, in terms of um, doing, finding, uh, reflecting upon the way maybe you are setting up the proportion as a student, and if you set it up wrong, quite often you do get ridiculous answers, and many students just go with that answer because they're so focused on the mechanics of the um, you know, cross multiply and divide uh, algorithm and procedure, they do lose track of the, the larger picture. And I think that's important not only here, you know, it's proportional reasoning, and, and we have to remember the second word there is reasoning, and that's, that's a key concept that we often forget. Brian, let me ask you, uh, if you, uh, think it, to, to think back on your classroom experience and also think about the professional literature, do you have specific suggestions for teaching proportional ideas? Again, I think, and, and Kay has kind of mentioned this and Bob mentioned it all, also already, one of the big ideas is to think about, within proportional reasoning, is to think about the equivalency between ratios, comparing ratios. Um, that is it's a, a fundamental aspect of looking at problems that if they think of them as ratios, think of them, uh, they can, can they find that they're equivalent? Uh, if you're looking for two things that are gonna be similar, they should be equivalent. There's an, another problem that we have from the OGT uh, the, from the March uh, 2004 it says, Alanis moved, is moving and needs to pack two mirrors. The larger mirror fits into a box that is 18 inches wide by 20 inches long. Her smaller mirror is similar in proportion to the larger mirror. Alanis determines that the width of the smaller box needs to be a minimum of 9 inches. What should the minimum length of the box to hold the similar mirror? Our responses are 2 inches, only received 5%. Six inches received 13 percent, nine inches received 13 percent, ten inches received 67 percent. This is a very, uh, I think, a fairly simple item that still only two thirds of the students answered correctly. And and you know when you look at this, if the student would have set up a a ratio of 18 to 20, and looked at what is an equivalent ratio and set up the ratio of nine to something that would be equivalent. They could, should, should be able to quickly understand and see that if it's nine to 18, that's been reduced by half, or it's a, a, a multiplication of one half, then I want to take one half of the 20. Uh, we can see that again with, the, the, with answer choice C of receiving 13%, most likely the students, again, subtracted, probably took the 18 minus the nine and came up with that answer. Um, because that's one of the, you know, again, they fall back to something that they would try a, just a computation if they're not sure of how to set this up and how to uh, approach this type of a problem. Can you have anything to add on this particular uh, item? I think that making a drawing the rectangles would help. It would help me anyway. <clears throat> and they would see maybe a better relationship between those numbers. Um. A long, long, long time ago when I was a classroom teacher, uh, I had this uh, probably not very good pedagogical rule that if a student was having difficulty with a word problem, I wouldn't help them unless they drew a picture of the word problem first. I, I guess I'd ask you to react to that as a teaching strategy and tell me if I was way out of line all those years ago. <laughs> I think as, as you look at professionals who work with mathematics and um, uh, different types of uh, quantitative problems, whether it's uh, statisticians or architects or engineers, uh, many of them do models and they draw pictures and they, even though 
they're professionals in their field. They, they are not ashamed to draw a picture and to make a sketch. So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with requiring students to do that. So Peggy, you shouldn't feel too bad about well, that. Thank so. you, Bob. <laughs> thank you. Um, we need to move on. And um, I'd like you to look at and, and comment on some more assessment items. These, these items come bo from both the state tests and the National Assessment of Educational Progress test. I'm hoping that as teachers observe our discussions, they might become interested in looking at their district data in the same way. What does it tell us about what the kids know and what does it tell us about how we could adjust our curriculum or instruction? Bob, let's start with an OGT item from 2007. Okay. On this particular problem, um, <clears throat> Janice had a five inch high by three inch wide photo enlarged to a three and five tenths foot tall poster. What should be the approximate width of the poster? Choice A of one and five tenths feet. We had 22% of our students choose that. That's an incorrect answer. And I think uh, quite possibly what happened here is again this misunderstanding of additive versus multiplicative reasoning. If you think about 1.5 and how students may have obtained that answer, uh, quite possibly they subtracted five minus three, got a difference of two, subtracted that difference of two from the three and five tenths foot tall poster. Um, choice B of two and one tenth feet, we, which is the correct answer, we had 58% of our students choose that. Choice C, four and five tenths feet, 11% of our students chose that. And again, uh, while we never can quite know 100% uh, for sure, but possibly students maybe did, did a subtraction of three and five tenths minus three, got five tenths as a difference and subtracted that from the five. Um, often just kind of making those numbers work so that they get one of those answers. Choice D of 5.8 or 5 and 8 tenths feet, um, we had 8% 8, 8 of our students choose that and, and that would be the solution uh, that you would obtain if you flipped over one of the ratios while setting up the proportion. It's interesting to note that this is kind of the same type of mistake. Uh, this is an OGT item, so this is, these are 10th graders. To answer your question earlier, Peggy, about students still making this mistake, we still had um, you know, a, a large uh, fraction or fifth or so of our students who are making this same mistake as 10th graders that they made uh, as 7th graders on an OAT test. Mm -hmm. What are the instructional implications? Uh, if, if we have this kind of difficulty with 10th graders? I think one aspect may be that they're moving, are we teaching them a procedure rather than, again, teaching them how to analyze the situation and looking at what would be reasonable? Um, you know, does it make sense, and, and, and the drawings that Kay has mentioned before, if a student was to kind of draw this out, would it make sense to have something that would be that much smaller? Does it look proportional? Um, getting them to actually try this in the classroom, you know, having them draw a three by five card and then what would it look like if, you know, you tried to draw something that was a different size and keeping it proportional. In our last webcast, we talked a whole lot about manipulatives and you, you guys have, have not come right out and said you need manipulatives for proportional reasoning but you really have alluded to drawings and mm -hmm. straws and <coughs> that kind of thing. So that, that comes up as, an, as a strategy again, right? Sure. I think in this problem also, you, as well as others, <coughs> using things like grid paper and number lines could really help students getting experience with those um, as, as well as some other types of manipulatives. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, we need to move on to um, a national assessment of educational progress item. Would you uh, lead us through this? Yes, this is from the 12th grade 1996 release test. This is Lewis mixed six ounces of cherry syrup with 53 ounces of water to make a cherry flavored drink. Martin mixed five ounces of the same cherry syrup with 42 ounces of water. Who made the, fl who made the drink with the stronger cherry flavor? Give mathematical evidence to support your answer. 
this is a, a short answer constructed response type item that as we look at the as we look at the response is still 42 percent got this incorrect got no points for it 26 percent got partial credit 23 percent got the correct about 10 percent omitted it or were off task on this item so if, as we look at this only about 50 percent maybe got some credit or all credit for this which is really surprising because again this is kind of like one of those items that what I talked about before is comparing ratios um, it's asking them to compare the ratio of five ounces to either 53 or five to if we're looking at part to part if we look at part to whole it's uh, or excuse me six ounces to 53 or six ounces to 59 if we're looking at part to whole uh, you know there's different ways that a student might address this type of item um, if I'm looking at trying to address this in the classroom, I might address it a little bit differently. One way is to think about a probability question. If I start out and I say that I have um, three blocks, two blues and a, and a yellow, and I'm asking somebody to draw them randomly out of a hat, what would be the prob you know, what would be the chances of me drawing a blue item? Compared to if I have nine blocks where five of them are blue and four of them are yellow, which am I more likely to get a, a, a blue? Which out of these two bags? Um, Bob, what do you think students would say? Well, I think initially they would they would look at the number of blue blocks uh, in both of the sets, and, and most many students would, would probably choose the set with the five blue over the two, mm -hmm. um, just simply as a, an initial thinking uh, be, without really um, going through the proportional reasoning. Yes. Now, Brian, let's go back to your question. How would you solve this problem? Tell your students to solve this problem. I would, um, I would probably, the way I would start out is ask them to take and divide 6 by the 53 or 6 by 59 and the 5 by 42 or 47 and look and compare those values and see which one is str has a greater value. And, and I will just point out that that's actually the unit strategy and it's a strategy that we use with unit pricing yes. in the grocery yes. store. It's another proportional reason, right. reasoning is. strategy, yeah. And it's something that, that <coughs> I think students, if they would, and, I, and from looking at the, the papers, uh, uh, when you go and look at this on, on the, the NAEP website, you can see how students and what got credit. Um, students who got partial credit maybe just started up and set up the two, at least set up the two proportion, the ratios. Um, but didn't get to actually comparing them of either trying to find a, uh, a common denominator or something along that line, but they just set them up. So you could do a little bit to at least get that idea that they had some aspect, but to get it correct, they would have had to actually gone through and, and, and done some type of work to move to that where they actually compare the two. I will share with the um, viewers that this has been one of the more interesting items because uh, we had a long conversation about how would you do that? How would you do that? And we had lots of differences among the panel, and those are the kinds of things we hope will happen as uh, faculties talk about this. Okay, we need to do another NAEP item, and uh, so if you would lead us through this, or if your well, voice will okay. hold out. <laughs> this is for eighth graders. They have a shipment of 500 batteries, a sample of 25 were selected. <clears throat> Two batteries were found dead. How many dead batteries were expected in the entire shipment? Um, <clears throat> what I think is difficult about this problem is students don't know how to begin what numbers to compare in the ratio. Do you pick the shipment to the sample or do you pick the dead batteries to the dead batteries? How do you set those ratios up? And you can do it in multiple, two ways that work. So that makes it even more difficult because there's more than one way you can get to the answer. But um, if you look at the, the selection students made, only 36% got this correct. Um, and I'm sure they randomly set up a ratio, ratios or just started doing some multiplication and division. For example, 12% got A, which was 10. Um, and they could have just set up the proportion in the order of the numbers that were given. Or they could have multiplied 25 by 2 and divided 500 by that. 22% um, chose B. That was another selection that 
many of them made, and that's 500 divided by 25. Now we're guessing on what they did, but that could be a possibility. And then the last item, E, 26% again uh, chose an incorrect answer, and they might have just multiplied 25 by 2. You almost seem to be suggesting that when, when students uh, see a word a problem like this and they, they see there are three numbers, 500, 25, and 2, they kind of try to guess what they should do <laughs> based on the numbers instead of reading the problem. Is that what you're really suggesting? And, and the two of you agree with that? Well, I, I think, yeah, I would agree with your statement that, yeah, a lot of times students will they, they have three, I, three problems or numbers here. <laughs> they know they're supposed to m maybe multiply or divide something. Because you know, of the cross multiplication. Because of the cross multiplication. All, so they start. Good. And whether they m multiply the right two numbers first and then divide, you know, or they might, you know, a lot of students, they multiply one thing or divide one thing and they see that answer and they, oh, there's that answer. And, and don't realize that as test developers many times they identify what students will do wrong and that's one of the s selections there because then it helps us as teachers to look and say oh okay I, I, the way that they're going to get this answer is by doing this most likely um, one way that I would approach this in my classroom and this may, makes me think about it is I would ask the students to actually when they were going to set this up or think about this is what are they actually comparing you know in this case they're comparing uh, the batter the batteries that are def defective dead to the total a number and I'd say oh write that out in words first and then set up a, pro a proportion to help me and I'm not sure that they know what um, sampling is how that really works so anything that you could give them an example of that um, I one of the things that I have observed in in classroom visits sometimes is that that teachers sometimes try to help students with a word problem like this by teaching them some kind of strategy like crossing out words or circling words. How effective do you think something like that is, Bob? I, I think you have to be real careful about those strategies. Uh, they do work sometimes, but often they may mislead students down the wrong path, teaching keywords of every time you see the word of, you multiply, or um, making sure you, you know, look for numbers that are um, um, factors of one another or something along those lines, I think would um, uh, sometimes work, but also, uh, as Brian mentioned, test developers are somewhat aware of those strategies <laughs> also. <laughs> so um, you, have to, you have to look at, um, you know, be careful there. You know, I, I w I'm interested, I would be interested to see in this problem if, if the numbers uh, were instead 25 and 500 of 27 and 500, what would happen and what would the result be um, just because uh, 25 being a factor of 500 makes it work so nicely um, what would happen if we change those around a little bit we do uh, again uh, let's go to the next item which is is an eighth grade item and really a very interesting item Bob will you lead us through this yes this is a, a lengthy item so um, we're gonna try to get through it here and, and mm in pieces. Uh, the Herm Hernandez family has a monthly income of $4,500. The Thomas family has a monthly income of $3,200. The two circle graphs show the monthly budgets of two families. So uh, the graphs are provided showing the Hernandez family with a budget of $4,500, the Thomas family of a, a monthly budget of $3,200, and the 45% region shaded in in both of these circle graphs. Um, which statement is supported by the data in the two graphs? Choice A, the Thomas family spends more dollars each month on transportation than the Hernandez family. B, the Hernandez family spends more dollars each month on food than the Thomas family does. Choice C, both families spend more dollars on other than on transportation and choice D, both families spend the same amount of dollars each month on housing. The responses as given uh, by students were 25% of the students chose A, and um, remember A was that the Thomas family spends more dollars than the Hernandez family. Choice B, 22%, and this was the correct answer, 22% of the students chose this, and this was that the Hernandez family 
spends more dollars than the Thomas family. 4% for choice C, which was that both families spend more dollars on other items. And choice D, 48% of our students chose this. Both families spend the same amount. And that was the choice which would seem to indicate that students only looked at the 45% region of the circle graph without looking at um, the larger total value of their monthly income. I think it goes back to the part to part, part to whole uh, discussion that we had earlier about students um, maybe not considering uh, the importance of the total when you're looking at proportional reasoning uh, problems and how that they probably just at an initial glance looked at the 45 percent and kind of um, stopped at that point and didn't really think through this any further. Ha have we done something instructionally that would cause that kind of reaction? I mean, uh, it's, 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 in the, it's in the verbiage of the problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it, as a, it's listed as part of the graph, 4,500, 3,200, and yet that was ignored by the students. I, I was wondering kind of the same type of thing, whether have we exposed students to problems that don't just read, read graphs. This, when students look at this problem, they tend to see it more as reading the graph, reading the circle graphs, rather than a proportional type problem. They're just going to look at it and say, oh, okay, they're the same. You look at uh, answer choice D, which, um, you know, D and A. A actually received more also than the correct answer did. And it's, it's also true by looking at the graphs alone. So do we give them the experience in the classroom of saying, here's, here's a graph, what's the proportionality that's taking place in here? And is there something different? I, I think this was a very different type of question than what students may typically see within a classroom setting. I'll, I'll make two points. One, Every teacher in the state of Ohio says to their students when they start to take these tests, read the item carefully. I yes. know they do. Yes. And yet, there's that issue. Um, so this is, this is not a simple kind of issue um, because if it were, we would have solved it a long time yeah. ago. Um, we have got uh, not a lot of time left, and then we've, we're getting a fair <laughs> number of email oh questions. Okay. Um, I will take number three first. Oh, at what grade would you recommend introducing cross multiplication to solve proportions? We've said don't do it too early, don't do it too early, and now these folks are holding our feet to the fire. When should they do it? Uh, I'll step out, and I'd say it's going to come naturally to the students and as, as you see it, as the students, as you give them problem situations, that time for when you actually say, okay, here's, a, here's what we're actually doing and showing that then. But I think if you give it right, you know, the research has shown that if you give them a, a, a process or an algorithm right up front, it kind of almost inhibits them from understanding the concept as well as if you start out with the concept and build to the algorithm. I think that's really an important point that by introducing the algorithm too soon we actually inhibit understanding. Yes. Okay. What, what about the, uh, Kay and, and Bob, what grade you <laughs> would you recommend introducing cross multiplication? Well uh, I, I guess I would pin it somewhere around seventh grade. Um, I think <laughs> there's a natural um, tendency to when kids are frustrated with doing proportional reasoning problems, to take the to show them the easy way, the quote easy way, um, instead of letting them struggle a little bit with the equal ratios, the whole concept of proportionality, which can be really beneficial for students to struggle through that and to get through that without kind of holding their hand and and saying, well, now I'll show you the easy way, and don't worry about the other. Right. which is frustrating oh. as a teacher because you want to help your students but you also um, need to hold back a little bit sometimes and some, some, some frustration is sometimes good for students to, to have to struggle with that. Okay? I agree. Okay. I, I don't have anything else to Well, I will move on <coughs> to another question then. Um, 
What kinds of activities for proportions sh should be used with older students who need intervention? And I think these are the kids that Brian just <coughs> referred to, the kids that we may have mm -hmm. introduced this algorithm a little too early, and now we need to give them intervention in order to pass the OGT. What kind of, what kind of ideas do you have for folks in that situation? Well, even older kids can do scale drawings and make scale drawings of pictures and, you know, whether they be a geometric figure or a car and get the idea of multiplication. That's one thing that comes to mind. Yeah, and I was trying to think of, you know, if, you know, talk also, talk with the physics teachers because they deal with proportionality all the time too and they can give you some things that they may be doing that would represent proportional reasoning uh, of how things work. Uh, the geometry aspect of things, um, getting boxes and asking, to having them check to see whether they're proportionally similar. Yeah, I think that there's just so many examples of real world applications as, as I kind of started out with. It, you know, it's, uh, model cars, I mean, large, the poster, pro a lot of projects that you can do that involve either enlarging something or shrinking it down to, si to a certain size, um, building um, scale models of houses, things that are just so so rich with the whole idea of proportionality. Um, you should be able to just look around the world on your way to work and find <laughs> many, many applications okay. of that. Rates of change yeah. too, rates of change. And, right. and just to jump in on that too, is don't always just use ratios that are nice ratios of one half doubling something. Get some that are a little bit different, two and a half times as much or three and a half, you know, something that's not that it's going to take them a little bit of thinking to think is, is that proportionally similar? Um, we're uh, very close on time and so I'm going to use this question as our summary question. Mm. Can you offer specific advice to pre-service teachers watching this webcast who will be in classrooms <laughs> next year? These people uh, are asking you experts, you experienced people, what can I do when I'm trying to teach proportional thinking reasoning? I know it's tough, Bob. Go to the Ohio Resource Center and find some <laughs> lessons. <laughs> uh, Thank you. There's, there's just a ton of lessons out there available. Um, and just, um, you know, there's, there's one called Something Fishy, which involves tagging fish and sampling and um, looking around at those real life applications, um, mm -hmm. get away from the textbook. And, and find some, some of those that are, that are out there and, and a lot of different places. NCTM has a ton of resources and books. There's a yearbook on proportional reasoning that I think um, the new teachers. 2002 yearbook. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Anything that's hands-on that can get that concept in their mind would be beneficial rather than solving for X. And I would agree and just echo that. <coughs> Try to not have them all be in the same same standard, not all geometry, but try to get the probability, the algebra, the number, and show how they relate to each other. Okay, you guys have said, don't jump too quickly to the algorithm, use manipulative materials, use the real world, and help them think through ratio and proportion. Can anybody add anything to that? That was good. Very good summary. <laughs> Today we considered some statewide results for some assessment items that require proportional reasoning. You may wish to see how your students perform on these OGT items by looking at your district's item analysis data. You can also use the materials provided to develop your own assessments and then it's, instead of guessing why students answered the way they did, you can ask them about their thinking and this can help you make decisions about instruction. We appreciate Brian and Bob and Kay for participating in this program and sharing their obvious vast experience with other mathematics educators in the state. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. And thank you for your participation and for all you do for your students every day. And for those of you who missed last week's program, it's now archived and available for you to view and share with your colleagues. For the Ohio Resource Center, I'm Peggy Costin, wishing you success with all of your mathematical instructional strategies.